Chapter 2. Miss Talbot's new to our school this year, and I got her for sixth grade. She's young, younger than Ma, but she's got the same kind of cheekbones up high on her face. Wears her hair the same, too. Pulled back on top, fixed with a bread, hanging loose around the shoulders. David Howard and I were sitting next to each other. Miss Talbot said we could sit wherever we liked. But it was up to us whether or not she'd let us stay there. Just a polite way of saying that if we cause any trouble, she'll change our seats faster than you can spend a nickel. Since she didn't know any of our names yet that first day, she asked each of us to tell her something about ourselves, and you wouldn't believe what some of the kids thought to say. Sarah Peters told how she fell off a swing last year and broke a tooth. Now, who do you think uh, cares about that? Tooth's been fixed. Ain't nothing to see. Turn the page. Fred Niles said they got a new baby sister at his house, which exactly isn't the biggest news in the world because he's got five sisters already. Then David Howard, he told how his family flew to Denver the last week of August, and Denver's called the Mile High City because the state capital's a mile up in the air. Only nobody believed him. So Miss Talbot got out the encyclopedia and showed us that he was right. Then she told us uh, something else that we did not know. There's a Denver, West Virginia, too. <laughs> in fact, two Denvers, uh, one in Preston County and one in Marshall. Miss Talbot's sister lives in one of them, she said. When it was my turn that day, I told about Shiloh and how I worked two weeks to make him mine, and, and then Michael Schultz told how there was this drunk man who drove by their house sometimes and once even knocked over their mailbox. Everyone started whispering then, and the whisper went around the room, Judd, Judd, Judd. It went from one person to the next. Miss Talbert didn't know who this Judd was. Somebody's father, maybe. So she just said that she hoped that whoever this person was, he would not get into his head to drive the, the next time that he was drinking because he might run over a child or a little dog. And since I was the only one that had told about a dog, she was looking right at me. And it didn't make me feel one bit better about leaving Shiloh alone all day. There's times that I wish we could just keep Shiloh in the house while I'm at school. But Ma says when you, you love someone, you, you don't, you don't want to keep them locked up. I mean, not like a dog like, like Shiloh who likes to, to run. I mean, when you love, you got to take chances. Every day when school lets out in Sisterville, the bus runs alongside the Ohio River till it gets to Friendly. Then it turns and then winds up a road toward the little community of Shiloh, which is where I found my dog, which is why I named him what I did. One by one, sometimes two or three at a time, kids get off. David, of course, he gets off in Friendly. Then Sarah and a few of the others and then Michael, and then Fred, and till at last it's only Daryl Ann and me. The bus goes as far as the old mill, and it turns around. And always, there's Shiloh, barreling down the driveway to meet us. His legs can't hardly go any faster. Skids sometimes, whole body leaning sideways, gravel flying out from under his paws. But he's standing there with his tongue out the minute Daryl and me step off that bus, ready to lick us up one side and down the other. <laughs> I love this dog more than I ever loved anything in my whole life, I think, except Mom and Dad and Becky and, well, I suppose even Daryl and... <sighs> One night, I dreamed that Judd Travers come to me with a shotgun, said, 
he was going to either shoot Shiloh or Darlin. Which would it be? I woke up in a cold sweat. I still could not decide. Suppose I'd save Daryl Lynn. It ever come to that, but boy, she'd have to work the rest of her life trying to make it up to me. I get out the scrap of sandwich that I always save in my lunch bucket, and I make a game of it with Shiloh. I take it out, cup it in my hands, and then lie down in the grass, hands under my chest. Shiloh tries every which way to roll me over and get that crust of bread or that little, little sliver of ham that's stuck to it. After he gets it, though, Daryl Lynn's got to go through all that hugging business, and Shiloh puts up with that, too. How's my little Shiloh, wallow, wallow, she sings, picking her up and picking him up in her arms like, like he's a baby. He washes her face clean with his tongue, especially the, the corners of her mouth where there's still the flavor of lunch. It's too disgusting to watch, if you ask me. So I go on up to the house, and Daryl Lynn comes after. On this day, Becky's on the porch swing, playing like it's an airplane or a boat or either one. Looks maybe like she's playing boat because she's got this little string hanging down over the side like she's fishing. When I get in the house, Ma's on the phone with uh, Dad's sister over in Clarksburg. First time we've ever had a telephone in three years. Ever since Grandma Preston's mind started to go, well, Aunt Hetty, she had to have a nurse come in while uh, she was at work to watch Grandma all the time. It was Dad who paid for that nurse. Every spare cent we had. Last month, though, Grandma Preston had a stroke. What little sense that she had all but left. Now, only that, but her kidneys also failed. She got a bad hip, so she can't even get in and out of the bed no more by herself. And Aunt Hetty, well, she's up half the night with her, still trying to work in the day. Hmm. Your mother needs more care than you can give her, the doctor finally says to Aunt Hetty. So Dad drove down, and he and Aunt Hetty put Grandma in a nursing home. Weird thing is, <laughs> though as long as we're all trying to care for Grandma Preston ourselves, Aunt Hetty doing the work, Dad sending the money, we did not get any help. Now that Grandma Preston's in a nursing home, not one penny to her name, the government pays for the nursing home. And Dad says, we can afford a telephone again and a few other things that we've had to do without. Darlene and me, well, I sit down on the table, taking turns easing our hands into a box of graham crackers and listening to Ma. She did, Hattie? Oh, land, what's next? Ma's saying. Becky comes in, and we give her a cracker. But soon as Ma is off the phone, I say, What happened? Ma shakes her head. I want the three of you to promise me that uh, if I ever get into acting crazy, you'll remember the me the, the way I am now. Daryl Ann gets this gleam in her eye. I'll remember you acting crazy, <laughs> she says. Well, Grandma do, I ask. How much trouble can she get into when she's in a wheelchair? Ma sighs. She'd been wheeling herself into other people's rooms, uninvited, men's rooms. She got it in her head that Grandpa Preston's still alive and they're hiding him here somewhere. Hmm. Becky stares, but Daryl Lynn laughs out loud. <laughs> And it's all I can do to not grin. Hmm. Aunt Hetty's afraid that if Grandma don't behave herself, they'll put her out. But those nurses, they know what to do. They understand, says Ma. Nice thing about telephone is it helps you make plans. Before, when I wanted to say something to David Howard, well, I'd have to give the message to Dad. And then Dad would have to tell it to David when he put mail in their box. 
Then I'd have to wait all day long for Dad to get home and find out what David said. Now, when the phone rings, everybody wants to answer. Becky, little Becky, when she gets there first, she puts her hand right up to the phone, and then she says in this tiny little voice, Hi, I'm Becky. I'm three years old, and I have a dog. Well, something like that. You almost have to sit on her to wrestle that telephone out of her hand. Phone rings again, and I answer. It's David. Uh, why don't you stay at my house Friday night, and I'll stay at yours on Saturday, he says. So I ask, I ask Ma. She says, yes, if I be sure that my socks and my underwear are clean. So Friday of that week, I put my toothbrush in my pencil case before I leave for school. And when Shiloh far, follows Daryl Lynn and me down to the end of the driveway, I'm thinking how when the bus gets back that afternoon, I'm not going to be on it. I kneel down in the grass beside my dog. Listen, Shiloh, I say. I'm not coming back tonight. I'm staying over with David Howard. But I'll be home tomorrow, okay? And as though he understands, uh, <laughs> it's almost as though he understands a single word, <laughs> did you? Uh, I'm thinking maybe he understands there's something wrong, something going on to be different, even though he don't know what it is. The bus comes round the bend, Shallow barks, <laughs> and he backs away. He don't care for much for that, that big yellow monster that gobbles up uh, us weekday mornings and then lets us off in the afternoon, each, each afternoon. After I get on the bus, I turn around. I always go to the back window and I look. I see Shiloh. He's trotting up the driveway, tail between his legs. He stops every so often and looks back. Then he goes a few steps more. And I'm thinking that as much as I like David Howard, much as I like going to his house, I sure do not like the thought of me being gone a whole night. Shallow at home without me. And, and, and Chet Travers, he's maybe out there in the dark. That's the end of chapter two. I'll be uh, putting up chapter three a day or two from now. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Thought I'd shoot this to the classroom. You guys can imagine yourself sitting on the couch. Bye.